Father, today we're going to preach on courage. And as I think back in my own life, I think there were moments when I showed great courage and great, great boldness. And, and truly, when I think about it, it was really first world courage and first world boldness. So, Father, we pray for, we pray for a third world boldness. <laughs> We pray for the kind of courage that faces persecution. Father, we want to be those children in your family. And we pray this in your son's precious and holy name. And all of God's children said, amen. 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 Have a seat. Uh, before I get started this morning, I just want to, I, I had, I, it hit me at the middle service, and I want to say it again, this, this service. Um, I don't know where you were. Some of you old people, old people. Can you remember where you were at 16? Can you remember where you were at 16? I begin to think today where I was at 16 because we've asked Nicolette while Luis is on the DL, the vocal DL, um, we've asked Nicolette not just to sing a song, we've asked Nicolette to lead worship in an 800 member church uh, this size and oh my goodness, how blessed are we. So thank you for that. So. I told her mom between services, it makes you feel good all that time I prayed for her when she was being born. So, um, so it's, uh, it's good. Let's, go, let's jump in. Last Sunday, if you missed last Sunday, um, I kind of exploded like a champagne bottle on New Year's Eve. So uh, it was, I apologize, it was just, I got carried away. Uh, I'm going to try to dial it back a little bit this morning and uh, just tame it down just so that, so that we don't beat anybody up. But last Sunday, we set our vision for 2019, and we declared that it would be a year dedicated to being unashamed, unashamed of Jesus, unashamed of our faith, unashamed of sharing Jesus with others. We begin to imagine that everything that might be different if we were unashamed, like our worship and our prayers and our service and our giving and our initiatives of forgiveness, our impact on kids and our grandkids. I, I'm convinced that everything in our world would be both different and better if we, the people called by his name, came out of hiding, abandoned spiritual cowardice, and lived unashamed for Jesus. You see, I have no problem with the gospel being explained to those who don't understand it. I have a huge problem with the gospel being changed in order not to offend anyone. Last week, we made it very clear in this church that we would never be a part of teaching that kind of gospel. Here's the point of today. I think if we're going to live a life of unashamed, a life unashamed for Jesus... It will require great courage. Now, this seems really odd living in a country where not any of us are at risk of death for what we believe. Nobody this morning risks being imprisoned on the way to church for owning a Bible. But sadly, in American Christianity, we have become super image conscious people. We want to be seen as going with the cultural flow, right? When I was younger, we called this being hip. I don't know what they call it today. I don't know what you young people call being cool, but we called it being hip back in the day, right? We wanted to just be hip. And, and the fact is, is that we don't really want to be different. We don't like getting involved. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to risk our standing in the land of social media. We just don't want to get our hands dirty. The problem with this kind of approach to Christianity is from its inception, Christianity has been countercultural. It was intended to go against the flow. It was intended for us to get our hands dirty. The big problem for the American church, as I see it, is that there are people who claim the name but can't commit to being fully in the game, risking their reputations. The truth is none of us, none of us will be courageous if our convictions are based solely on people's perception of us instead of being found playing to an audience of one. The fact is, is that I don't meet anybody who couldn't use a little bit more courage. I, I literally, I mean, even if you're that person out there, go, you know what? I have all the courage I need. Call me. I'd love to see what that looks like. All right? So I, I find that everybody could use just a little more courage. Courage to stand up against evil. Courage to take a step of faith. Courage to say no to their kids. Courage to have hard conversations. Courage to not compromise their integrity. Courage to love unconditionally. Courage to face uncertainty, trusting God for the gap of the unknown. Undergirding most conversations that I have in my office is a common theme. People ultimately talk about the gap that exists between their worst fears and the courage they wish they had. Right? There's a gap between these are my worst fears and man, I so wish I was brave enough to face it. Right? But what if I told you today you have that courage. It's already inside of you. 
this kind of death-defying kind of courage. I think most people go to great lengths to protect themselves from the broken world, protect themselves from being hurt. We will go to great lengths to protect our children from evils and, and dangers that are lurking everywhere, right? I mean, we, we'll, we'll baby-proof our house. We'll buy organic food. We'll, we'll do all these kind of, kind of things for our kids, right? But when it comes to our spiritual life and ensuring that we pour a foundation for our children's faith, we can be a little bit more flippant, right? We can be really dedicated to making sure our children get everything they need except maybe being down the hallway, you know? I, I hear from parents all the time frustrated with their teenagers about wanting them to make good choices, wanting to make good decisions, but somehow they can't figure out how to get them to youth, right? Something that we provide so that teenagers can make good choices and make good decisions and have a foundation for life. We tend to be a little bit more flippant with our spiritual life. Listen, I want to share this. Nobody builds a house at the base of a volcano. Nobody pitches a tent in the middle of a lion's hunting ground. Nobody sleeps with snakes. And furthermore, nobody eats a quinoa burger when they could have the real thing. I'm just telling you that right now. Yet there are Christians running around these days, man, just risk-free, man. Ooh, man, I don't, you know, I don't know. They just are so calm. Their faces don't look any stressed. They, you'd swear they had ice water running through their veins. And you ask yourself, who are these brave people? Well, they're accommodationists. People who rewrite the Bible to accommodate their lifestyle. Whenever they run across scripture verses or principles that attack their position, they alter them or ignore them entirely to accommodate their pleasures. And two things always happen in this approach. Number one, all desires, no matter how wrong, are fulfilled. And all guilt, no matter how justified, is erased. I believe that you can allow the word of God to change your life, or you can try to find loopholes in it so you don't have to. This is an accommodating theology. So I just sat at my desk this week and wrote around about, about a dozen things that I've heard people say in my office. I'm going to share five of them with you today that is an accommodating, examples of an accommodating theology. I hear people say, God just wants me to be happy. So it doesn't matter what I vowed, right? God will understand. I hear people say, there was a time that what you're talking about, pastor, was considered immoral, but that time has passed. We don't think that's immoral anymore. God gave me this desire and it's, it's okay. I, it's okay for me to enjoy it. I hear people say, look, nobody's perfect, right? We're all sinners. And if I hurt somebody, then they just need to put their big boy, big girl boots on and get over it. Except boots is not the example they use. So it's, uh, you know, I hear people say, listen, I just, I just cut a small edge. I just cut the corner a little bit. But isn't that what grace is for, right? To cover those moments when we just, it was a little lie. It wasn't a big lie, right? And the, the one that I hear most often is, what I'm doing isn't going to hurt anybody but me. I don't know why anybody cares. These are accommodating lies that ultimately deny things like what it means to be holy, what it means to be pure and honest and kind and generous. The fact is, is if you sow a lifestyle that is in direct disobedience to the revealed word of God, you will ultimately reap disaster. And here's the issue. The consequences of sin don't always come immediately, but they will come eventually. And the ripple effect of pain it causes for others is really, really real. And I know this because that's where I get to live, is in the ripple effect of pain that it causes. And when it happens, there will be no excuses, no rationalization, no accommodating that will filter the consequences of God. One of the side effects of sitting under the tree of God's words is that you can choose to look the other way and you can choose to ignore it, but you can never again say, I didn't know. Right? This morning, you will hear the word of God. You will not be able to leave this building and go, hey, I didn't know. You heard it proclaimed. To live our life and truly miss the great purpose that we are designed to accomplish is a sin. It's inconceivable that we would bear no responsibility in a world with so much wrong to tackle, with so much ignorance to overcome, with so much misery to alleviate. But to engage this world and this culture is surely going to take some courage. Yeah, here's the funny thing to me. When I was a boy, you spent your lawn mowing money or your paper delivery money on one of two things. Paper, there was a time that papers were delivered to the house, and boys on bicycles did that. Some of you remember those days. They don't do that anymore, but that's the way it was back in those days. But if you were a boy and you had lawn mowing money or you had paper delivery money, what you spent that money on was one of two things as a boy. You either bought sports trading cards with them or you bought DC or Marvel comic books. 
That was the only options when you were a boy, that you owned one or the other, right? There was no gray in between. And here's, here's what's been so crazy to me, is the comics, I was one of those sports card guys. I didn't understand any of these, I didn't know who the Avengers were until recently. I learned it from Nathan and Luis. And so, anyway, <laughs> so here's what's crazy. The comics have now come to the big screen in our day, right? You don't buy a comic book, you go watch a comic book, right? I read the other day, this is so fascinating to me, that Marvel and DC superhero movies outgross in revenue all other movies combined. All other movies combined. We have an infatuation as a culture with all things courageous. We find hope in men and women with superpowers and unlimited courage and yet somehow can deny Jesus Christ. Isn't it crazy? We have become a culture of the timid living vicariously through the big screen heroes we see instead of stepping out and courage ourselves. Do you, this is also this is fascinating. This just may be interesting to me, and you're just going to have to live in the overflow of that. Did you know? Did you know the target audience for these movies, these DC Marvel movies? You know what the target age group is? 25 to 45. That's the target age group for these movies. They are not made for our young people, right? There are, did you know there are more than 50 different superheroes with a variety of talents that exceed our human limitations in the sky, in the air, in space, in the ground? There's some people made a rock. It's just, it's crazy. America cannot get enough of these movies. Because you know why? We like seeing darkness repelled. We like seeing justice served. We like seeing evil defeated. We just don't believe that's our job. <laughs> right? You got to you hire somebody for that job. Uh, on our way home from Greece and Turkey, the person sitting next to, me, next to me was watching Deadpool. Trust me, this is not a children's movie, all right? And I turned to Didi and I said, you shouldn't be watching that. You need to change that channel. <laughs> so, so, I'm just kidding. So, Didi was watching some girly flick Hallmark thing. So right, but the guy, the guy in the row in front of me on the end, I was on an aisle seat. The guy, he's watching it, and I, I just, I'm trying to watch my movie, but I'm. <laughs> right, you know, it's like I come home and I said, I told Nathan, I said, I watched part of Deadpool. He said, you should not watch the rest of Deadpool. And he was like, he was adamant that I shouldn't do that. Right? I mean, listen, listen seriously. What is it about courage? or the lack thereof that consumes us. You see, I think we all want to be brave. I think we all want to be brave. I think we want to be, be in a church where we all want to be courageous. I think we want to be unashamed. I think we want to believe that we would never deny Christ. But some days, some days we lack the courage to follow through, to take a risk. I want everybody to go to Joshua chapter 1. This is a transitional story between the leadership of Moses and Joshua, right? So let me set it up for you. What we know about Joshua is Joshua's in the second in command. He's been the aide de camp to Moses for 40 plus years. Uh, it's like being vice president. You have a speaking part, but nobody really listens to you. You don't get to make any decisions. So what's crazy to me as I read this passage is Moses, who does all this incredible work, writes all this kind of stuff, writes all this books, all this stuff. Literally, he dies and he gets a verse and a half. I mean, there is no fanfare. Nobody throws him a party. There's not a whole chapter talking about. And when Moses died, we partied for 40 days. You know, I mean, there's just no, no. We had a wake. I mean, literally, wait till you read this. This is, this is incredible to me that, that Moses, man, it is like literally in God's mind, next man up. That's what God thinks, right? Next man up. So look at, look at Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then. That's it. That's all Moses gets. That's like, that's like it, man. And then God's like, now then, right? So he's, God has clearly moved on. Um, he says, now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give them uh, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, I promise, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to the Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all to the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Now, now God starts to bear in a little bit. He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. 
Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore their ancestors to give them. Now, something must be happening in Joshua's face as God says this. Because, because God has to repeat himself again in verse 7. <laughs> because he must look at Joshua and go, oh, you're not getting this. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And again, Joshua must have had that deer in the headlight look because God has to say again, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. Church, it's been my practice since I got into ministry 20 years ago that if I have to have a hard meeting with anybody, I read Joshua 1. I just read it all the way down through verse 9 every single time. This is a take the hill kind of passage. This is a charge the gates of hell kind of exhortation. This is God speaking to us today that says quit living in so much daggum fear. As, as I shared last week, I can see the storm clouds brewing for our denomination and the horizons, the horizons are dark for Western Christendom. But what if I told you, what if I told you that I believe this is the best time to be a Christian? I, I mean, I know it may not seem like it from terrorist attack to racial injustice to political divisions and chaos to an increasingly secular worldview that seems to have lost any sense of a moral compass. We find ourselves in some unique and challenging times for sure which I believe God will use to sift the faithful and the fruitful from the lukewarm. I think God is going to use these times to sift the faithful and the fruitful from the lukewarm. lukewarm. It will be a winning floor. It will be a sifting process this season. We see fear running rampant all across the cultural landscape, and increasingly, people in the pews of American churches feel paralyzed by fear, and more importantly, they feel isolated. Well, welcome to the age of unbelief. So unless you place your head in the sand and leave it there, there is no denying the fact that fewer and fewer people are claiming to be Christians and that we are being relegated to cultural obscurity. We literally are seeing the end of the age of Christendom in our country unfold for our very eyes. If the way of our neighbors and co-workers look at us when you mention Jesus, have you ever noticed that? If you talk about Jesus or you talk about what Jesus says about salvation or the Bible or about relationships or love or truth or any of this, if any of this is an indicator, we for sure are in a new era in our time. I, I, I walk most mornings. Dee and I walk sometimes early in the morning together. And when I sleep in and she goes to work, I get up and walk later. It's, it's a good deal for me. So... Um, <laughs> One of the things I do is I prayer walk. I pray for our neighbors. I pray for you. I pray for our church. I just prayer walk when I'm out walking. So a couple months ago, I'm out walking, and I see one of our neighbors down on the other end of the street. He's got his truck, and he's backing up. He's pulling garbage and stuff out of his truck, pallets and all this heavy stuff out and putting it by the side of the curb for the garbage man to get. And literally, I just start to walk over to him, right? And as I get there to help him, I mean, I'm like at the back of his truck, and I'm going to grab something. I, he says to me, he says to me, he says, I hope you're not expecting me to come to church. <laughs> said, I appreciate the help, but I really don't have any interest in coming to church. He was worried that there might be some sort of quid pro quo, right? That, that it wasn't like I was wearing a t-shirt that said, in exchange for help, I expect you to come to church. I mean, there was literally, I mean, I, there must have been some sort of expectation, right? So literally, literally when I approached the truck, I didn't say anything other than, here, let me help you. And his response to, here, let me help you was, hey, I hope you don't expect me to come to church. Which means all my neighbors know that I'm the pastor that lives down the street. He and I had never met. I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm a marked man. Right? So, you know, so, all right. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. We are currently experiencing what Pastor Matt Chandler in Dallas, Texas calls the intolerance of intolerance. Christians with traditional convictions and biblical understandings are now seen as archaic, bigots, hate mongers, and backwards people from the dark ages. And all we ever said was, hey, can we help you? I'd like to help you. I want to help you. I've found that Christendom historically has had three responses 
that are ineffective to this cultural phenomenon. Uh, most of this work comes from Andy Crouch's book, Culture Making, that I read this summer. Um, I'm just going to share a few of them. There's a lot more. The first failed approach by Christendom is converting the culture. The problem is, is nowhere in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, or in any of Paul's letters, do we see any attempt to convert the culture. We do see individuals being convicted by the Holy Spirit of their sin and changing their life and influencing the culture with love and mercy. In the modern world, converted culture has been about trying to politically steer nations back to biblical values, legislating morality, and demanding change. It has worked nowhere in the world. Nowhere in the world did we go, oh, we see a great example of where that worked. It was inconceivable in the first century that anyone in the early church thought the goal was to change Rome. The same is true today. You can't legislate people into the kingdom of God. It's a trap for hypocrites. Over the years, I've watched Christians boycott certain things, right? Have you ever, Christians are funny people about boycotting things. Remember a few years ago, we were going to boycott Disney, right? Remember that? We were going to, nobody, no, Christians weren't going to go to Disney, right? Uh, well, we showed them, didn't we? <laughs> right? And since Disney World is closed, the world has been a far better place <laughs> since we drove them into bankruptcy. I mean, seriously, here's the deal. The phone we all have and so easily provide to our children and grandchildren is more dangerous than anything the world out there could ever bring against us. Right? I mean, seriously. And people inside and outside of Christendom, man, refuse to give it up. I mean, no one, no one's given up Amazon because they don't believe in the CEO's principles and values. I would go as far as to say attempts to convert culture has created unholy alliances and compromises that have left people suspicious of us. As I said last week, the modern idols of our world are Amazon, Google, and Apple. The truth is, is culture has converted us. This is the truth, right? Can you handle the truth? I mean, we just don't want to give it up. So we go, oh, I don't believe that. My phone is okay, right? But it's true, right? Secondly, Christianity has tried to condemn culture. This is the idea of removing ourselves from the world, returning to a subculture uh, that is safe and staying away from a culture because society is sinful, corrupted and antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This has been appealing and popular response by the church since the very first century. We see this in the Patristic Fathers, in the rise of monasteries all throughout the Middle East and in Europe. These monasteries arose for this very purpose. Some of you may know there was a group of people called the Essenes that moved out from Jerusalem to live in the desert. They were going to live, live this uh, nomadic life, and they did it to get away from culture and society. Please, somebody in the church, ask me how many Essenes there are today. Thank you. I appreciate you asking, Mark. There is zero Essenes remaining in the world today. It did not work. It did not work, right? Here, here's the problem with this approach. It's not biblical. The Bible says we are to be salt of the earth, a light on a hill that is not to be hidden. However ungodly our community might be, we are not living in Babylon. Culture is not the source of evil the human heart is when it twists the good gifts of God into selfish purposes. The fact is, closing culture won't close sin. The third approach is to assimilate, to consume culture. It's the philosophy of, hey, we tried to beat them, we might as well just join them, right? So in this approach, we see the Bible and Jesus as a couple of aspects alongside other aspects of life, sitting side by side with none having a greater priority than the other. They're just, it's just an aspect of life. It's just one part of the way I do life. This kind of assimilation has created a consumer mentality to church, where the church is the place for me to get my needs met, when I want them met, how I want them met, and the way I want them met. And when this doesn't happen, we've created a category for this. We call it church shopping. You know, we go church shopping, right? We put church in the same category as grocery stores and restaurants and gas stations and sports teams. If I'm not happy, I'll just trade it in. I'll just get me another church. All right, so I want to be clear this morning because I don't want anybody to mishear me. There are three times, three times that you should leave a church. You should leave a church if it's not a good fit. I tell people that come to our church frequently, listen, sometimes it's just not a good fit. Georgia is not a fit for everybody. Nobody should propose marriage without dating. You should come for a while and make sure it's a good fit. The second time that you should leave a church is, is when the Bible and Jesus is not being preached. 
You should just get out of there as quickly as you can, right? Right, when, when the gospel of Jesus is not being preached, right? You should go. And then the third time is sometimes the Holy Spirit will convict you to go to another church to help advance the kingdom of God through that church, to take your gifts. It's what Dave Campbell's done by moving to Birmingham, right? The Holy Spirit worked in his life to move him to Birmingham where he could take his gifts, right? I'm not sure Jesus' idea of church was to make us happy. I don't think Jesus got up this morning and thought, man, I hope those people in Georgiana are really happy. I hope they're happy this morning. I think, I think Jesus got up this morning and said, man, I hope those people in Georgiana are holy this morning. I hope they're holy like I am holy. I hope they are <laughs> sacred like I am sacred. I have found that personal trainers, personal trainers, don't have to stop exercising to attract clients. Let that sink in for a minute. Right? They don't have to quit exercising to attract clients. And we shouldn't become worldly in order to attract the world. All three of these options, converting, condemning, and assimilating, are very different failed responses to finding a home for our spiritual life to fit in. But they all have one thing in common. They are born of fear and what people are afraid to lose. What I believe we need is a courage to stand in culture without fear, without blinking, without yielding. I tell people all the time, Jesus does not need you to be his lawyer. He needs you to be an extension of his mercy and grace and love in and, and a broken and depraved world. You can, but you can't do that unless you're standing in the middle of it. you got to be right in the middle of it. I believe in this post-9-11, post-modern, post-everything world that courage is what we need. If our hearts aren't right, if our hopes are misplaced, if our faith is misaligned, anything we try to do will short, be short-lived and eventually crumble. I personally want an Acts 2 kind of faith that shared everything, loved everyone, prayed without ceasing, and did not compromise its values even unto death. I find that courage is something that is far easier to talk about than it is to live out. It's always easier to live out a fear of one kind or another, but fear never changed anything for the better. Fear never kept the church standing firm. Fear never produced joy. Fear won't free us to live positively and confidently in our culture. Church, I believe that courage is not the absence of fear, but the presence of faith we cannot see. I believe courage is peace, the peace that Jesus says passes all understanding. The kind of peace that stared down the cross and didn't flinch. The kind of peace that endured mockery and being spat upon. The kind of peace that regularly felt betrayal and abandonment. This is the kind of courage we have access to in Jesus Christ. You know, most people think courage is the lack of fear, but that's not true. If there is no fear, then there can't be courage. Fear is what prompts courage to rise up within it. And it is the peace of Jesus that gives us confidence to do so. It's the power of the empty tomb, isn't it? For three days, the disciples were where? They were cowering in an upper room. They were terrified and they were afraid. But on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And then everything they had to fear in this world was suddenly evaporated. It was gone. The world we live in doesn't want you to know the Prince of Peace. They want you to feel peace in the middle of your sin. The words fear not appear 365 times in Scripture. God keeps reminding us that in Christ, we have the courage to conquer anything. Church, I believe real courage is what we need when we're anxious, when we're worried, when we're uncertain, when we doubt, when we just don't know how to push through. When I look at the cultural landscape, the political situation, the racial divide, the global terrorism bent on stealing innocence, the number of people leaving the faith every week, the growing hostility towards God's word, honestly, I get it. I get why people are afraid. I have some days in my office where it just it feels fearful. But here's what I know. You can't sit in fear and honor God at the same time. You just can't do it. The two are incompatible. We cannot let this fear grip us, cripple us, and rob us of the joy of being in this world and holding us back from living faithfully and standing up for the gospel. We can't let fear keep us from engaging the culture and the world with the courage that Jesus has come and Jesus will come again, right? That's the hope we have. Let me, let me close with this. Luis, wherever you're at, I know I'm over time. Come on. <sighs> All right. Some would say, that it's way too easy to serve Jesus in the 21st century America. Again, no one's life is on the line, nobody's going to prison, nobody's gonna to go to jail. It's just your public reputation, maybe. What if we were truly unashamed of what other people thought of our faith? 
What if we weren't trying to do image management or, or some side of massaging our sin into a comfortable place, but actually sought to look like Jesus? As I said last week, you're either image bearers of a risen Lord or you are not. We either believe the Bible is true or not. We either follow his commands or not. There is no gray in the kingdom of God. All told, if you are serving the Lord, you will be persecuted. If God's favor is on your life, you'll be lied about, betrayed, and ridiculed. If Jesus is working through you to impact the kingdom of God and repel darkness, you will be the victim of rumors and gossip and slander and other forms of abuse and often at hands of people you trusted and people you loved and people you thought were close to you. A good, a good friend of mine who's a pastor says all the time, if you want to find a genuine apostle of Jesus Christ, you'll find him or her buried under a pile of rocks. And I would add that if you want to find a true servant of God, pull up their shirt, examine their back, and you'll find plenty of stab wounds and beating marks because at the least, at the least I have found that some people will love you until they get what they want or until it costs them something they don't want to give up. And then they will be done with you. It's why genuine relationships inside the church are so critical. I say all the time, if you're not coming face to face with the enemy, you need to be very concerned that you're not walking in the same direction he is. You should be coming face to face with him every day, right? Jesus said in Luke 6, 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Here's the bottom line. If you actually wish to live a life unashamed and have the Lord use you in mighty ways, your image concerns have got to go to the cross. To do this is going to take some courage. I often wonder, I sit in my office, I think about weird things. I read the Bible and I think of weird things. I wonder if I would have followed Jesus in the first century. I wonder if I'd have had the courage to go, man, that's the son of God. I'm going to follow him. Wherever he goes, I want to go. What about you? I mean, you know, would you have followed Jesus in the first century where it might have really cost you something? Courageous boldness is what it takes. In Acts chapter 4 and 5, we see the disciples becoming bolder by the moment. Um, I thought about just reading Acts 4 and 5 to you today, um, but man, it's really long and you'd have missed out on all that ranting that I did. So, um, <laughs> So I'm just going to share a couple of snippets to give you a picture. So we see the disciples becoming bolder and bolder after Pentecost. The movement has begun. Peter and John have been arrested for healing a guy. You can't make that up. They got arrested. They healed a guy that was somehow illegal. And so here's what happens. I'll pick it up in verse 18. So they're chastising them. and They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And so guess what they do? They go back out and they preach some more and they teach some more. And they find themselves in the upper room. They're praying. And here's what they prayed. Now, Lord, consider their threats against us and enable your servants to speak your word with greater boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And as they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Then, then they are arrested again, and an angel frees them from prison, because that's what angels do. And then we pick it up here in verse 27 of chapter 5. It said, the apostles were brought in again to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. And he said, we gave you strict orders. Not to teach this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with the teachings and determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as the prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given and chose us to obey. And then, so they don't know what to do. So it says that the speech persuaded them, so they didn't kill them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Well, this is three times. Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name and then after that, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. 
This is what we need in our age. The kind of boldness that says, you can't shut me up about my Jesus. So you see, the world wants you to live in the gray, in the shadows. You see, in a world of gray, it's not complete darkness and depravity, so you don't always feel that bad, but it's not fully in the light either. You know, everything is permissible in the gray. Everything is okay in the gray. But coming into the light of Christ is a declaration of war against darkness and depravity, right? Jesus wants you to be smack dab in the middle of culture, standing tall and trusting that God is God. And he will not leave you and he will not forsake you so you can be strong and very courageous. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing.